Well, we mentioned earlier how you spotlighted George. Uh, John Lennon did get his moment, solo career, and uh, bringing up Elton John again. Whatever gets you through the night, 1974. Number one in the U.S., to John's surprise. Uh, number 36 in the U.K. In fact, John Lennon's only number one solo hit. And it's interesting you tell in the book how he, you know, people can read it for themselves, but you tell how he got that title from a late-night TV evangelist and everything. So those are the little stories. That, as you say, when you go back and hear it again, you go, oh, well, okay, that's cool. And, and, you know, it was, you know, I mean, it would have been cliché to do Imagine, for instance, as the track. Right. You know, I want to do something else. And, yeah, this was his only U.S. number one during his lifetime, which is amazing. You know, Ringo had two off um, the Ringo album in 1973. Right. Um, and here's John Lennon, you know, scrabbling around to get a U.S. number one. It's a memorable track. It's not maybe my one of my favorite tracks of his, but it, it's certainly memorable in, in terms of the collaboration with Elton John. Definitely, and it sort of led to him uh, performing live with Elton. Um, there was a connection there. I think that Elton had said, if this goes to number one, you have to play live with me. And John goes, oh, sure, I'll do that, because if it's number one, that'll never happen. And then it did. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, Madison Square Garden, he joined him on stage, nervous as hell, but he did it. He was good to his word. 10cc, I'm not in love. Number two US, number one UK. And this was the case where you spoke with the man himself, the artist Eric Stewart. Yeah, that's right, because he actually, a lot of people don't realize, he not only was, you know, one of the producers, or really the main producer, he was the engineer. You know, it was at his own studio, Strawberry Studio. And so uh, he was the engineer on it and he co-wrote the song. So, yeah, he was the, the guy to get for this. Super nice guy and uh, great story, you know, in terms of how they, you know, the multi-layered backing vocals. And uh, it, it was, you know, cutting edge for its time, without a doubt. Yeah, the, the vocal effect and the... Uh... Big Boys Don't Cry little hook and the, the idea that it was originally a bossa nova that they rejected, but then everybody kept, you know, people around the studio, employees kept singing. The, it was catchy. They knew it was catchy, so they reinvented it, and there's a lot to it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it's like you – it's one of those ones where you, even within 10CC, they never did anything really like that again. Um, wow. But, yeah, that's why I'm a music fan, you know, for life because of these – little bits of art, and just to continue to demonstrate the variety, and I certainly remember when this song came out, 1975, Donna Summer, Love to Love You Baby. Um, oh, yeah. I mentioned earlier about you track all the different studios. People may be surprised to know that that was recorded in Munich, Germany. Yeah, at Musicland. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the um, engineer, Reinhold Matt, was German, but I actually spoke with the producers and, and writers of the song, Giorgio Moroder and Pete Bellotti. Yeah. So that, that was nice, you know, to get both their takes on it. And uh, fortunately, they agreed with one another. And I don't know if this is quite fair. We're tracking genres. I don't know if we can call this the actual beginning of disco, but it was certainly a genre that was rising in the 70s, and this was certainly a player in that scene. I remember Johnny Taylor had a song, Disco Lady, and there was a, a few other things. Um, you know, Casey and the Sunshine Band, before they sort of had their hits, they did that uh, George McRae song, um, Rock Your Baby. So it's hard to say exactly, but this was certainly one of the early disco hits and a big hit, number two U.S., number four U.K. But what I didn't know until I read your book was this was Donna Summer was singing on a demo for another artist. It wasn't supposed to be for her. It was like, can you come sing this so we can demo it? And then, you know, and, and of course, this is, <laughs> we'll see this trend coming up too, recordings being banned. This was banned because of all the, you know, sexual explicit, the moaning and the groaning. Well, if you want to, you know, sell albums, get somebody to ban it. Oh, listen, you know, I remember in the UK growing up, anything that had the sticker on it banned by the BBC, they'd actually put that on the cover as a badge of honor. That would guarantee the sales. I'm glad I have you as a guest for this next one, because I think you have a particular insight um, as a transplanted Englishman. And another new genre, punk rock. We're talking about Anarchy in the UK, The Sex Pistols, 1976. Um, my impression of punk rock was it was as much a social movement as a music product. And it was a lot of it was related to the realities of being a teenager in the UK as opposed to in the US. I mean, what, can, what insights can you offer in that regard? Yeah, I mean... Well, to be honest with you, as soon as it became popular, it, it died in, in terms of its, you know, how can I put it? it? It died in terms of its authenticity. 
because it really was it was much harder edged than the US version for me anyway, uh, as is a, often the case it, um, when we get to music and a lot of cultural things that there's a bit more edge in the UK. And here we're going full bore with that kind of edge. And it was it was the street music of, you know, kids with not much money um, in Britain at that time. And it's kind of like, how can you say, in terms of the sensibility, it's a bit like skiffle music 20 years earlier in Britain, where, you know, like the Quarrymen, the early version of the Beatles, where they can't afford the expensive instruments. And they just, you know, put a band together with the basics and without much knowledge of how to even play. And they just get into it a bit like garage rock. And so this for me is the epitome of that. But it's right on that you know, at, on, on the cusp of it becoming commercial. And then, of course, the record companies take over and everyone's now a punk rocker. And then that moves into new wave as if that's a kind of offshoot of punk when really it was like nothing to do with punk, most of it. Um, so this was a seminal track for me. It had to be in the book. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I played with a, a, an English bass player in the 80s and who had also transplanted to... The U.S., you know, I was in Northern California and I asked him about, you know, why did you leave England and come here? He just said it was just way better here. I don't know if he just meant op employment opportunities or what it was. I mean, I've been, to, I'm, a, I'm an Anglophile. I was born in England. I've traveled there. I love it. But there are definitely differences. I mean, for example, uh, when I was in downtown London, I know that it's really difficult to, you know, let's say remodel the outside of your you know, restaurant or something. You need all these permits and it's all, and there's a lot of apologies. You know, we apologize for the inconvenience and it's just a different uh, aesthetic than there is here, right? Yeah, it's funny actually, because I think a lot of Americans sort of look at the British oh, as being very ordered and sort of stiff upper lip and polite and standing in line for the bus. But as I always say to them, well, have you heard of the soccer hooligans, you know? And uh, okay. so, so it's like everything, right? There are two sides to the coin. So you do have that aspect of it. But especially in that era um, of the sort of mid to late 70s, it was something of a social revolution, you know, and uh, the voice of the BBC disappeared, you know, that sort of posh, this is the BBC. Right. And suddenly it was replaced by people with northern accents, you know, without elocution lessons. And punk was all part of that sensibility. And it's funny you were talking about it was the music of kids who couldn't afford instruments. You know, you said in the book, Steve Jones, his amp. He was the guitarist for the Six Pistols. His amp had no front grill, and you could just see the speakers. And the reason was because he had stolen it, and the band he stole it from, their name was written on the grill, so he had to take it off. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of stuff that's hilarious. Oh, isn't it? You want to encapsulate, you know, the spirit of the Sex Pistols. But, you know, that's the catch-22. You know, something's popular because it's not popular. You know, something's popular because it's our personal thing. Then it goes mainstream, and you're like, well, pff, this is over. You know, right. and so and as the artist, what are you supposed to do? Not be successful? It's kind of a tough one. Yeah. Well, just to show how eclectic the 70s were, the same year as the Sex Pistols, Fleetwood Mac, Go Your Own Way. Um, number 10 in the U.S., number 38 in the U.K. as a song, but of course that album was just omnipresent. And here's a band with three British members, two American, and, um, you know, the story in there, and we're not going to go into all the stories because we want everybody to read them, but, you know, I had heard about this where, and Steely Dan had this problem too, they played back the recording so many times that they literally wore out the tape. Right, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, that was one of many problems behind the scenes here, right? Because, <laughs> as you say, you know, Fleetwood Mac was now... You know, this with the Americans and the British and female and male, um, it completely reinvented itself from its original incarnation as a, as a real blues rock band. And uh, but it catches them right at the point where two couples within the band are breaking up. And so and, and here's Go Your Own Way, which, as Stevie Nick said, you know, Lindsay Buckingham has r basically written these lyrics and here, she, you know, it is him sort of basically saying to her, loving you wasn't the right thing to do. Right. Which, like immensely cruel to put her through this, you know. I mean, it, it's amazing. And yet here they turn adversity again into great art. But it is. It's so different to what we were just talking about with the Sex Pistols. This is the big budget polished album. Yeah. And it's sold by the bucket load. Uh, Stevie Wonder songs in the key of life. And when that sucker came out in 76, um, uh, I heard the song as uh, it wasn't one of the hits, but it was the first thing I heard on the radio. And I said, oh, I'm going to get this album. I said, 
already aware of Stevie Wonder and already a fan. And I got that album, I go, oh my god, like it's, it's an instant classic. It's like a, it's like seeing you know the the statue of David in Florence or something. It's like a, it's an indisputable masterpiece. It was huge in '76. I, I was 17 at the time. And, you know, this was Saturday night parties and this was the soundtrack of the time because it had so many great hits on it, so much energy um, and also a lot of self-indulgence, but in a good way. You know, the, these tracks where you, you don't want it to end just yet. And with Stevie, it didn't end just yet. <laughs> you know, they go on and on. Yeah. You, the playouts on those, it was obvious that there wasn't a third party uh, producing the album. Because yeah. I'll say, well, you let that uh, four-minute harmonica solo at the end of "Isn't She Lovely" sounds good, but you know we got it faded before that, and you could tell he was in control. Of that, but you know, I'm. You had mentioned the Motown and the Beatles and the the Beach Boys all sort of influencing each other. Where it said that Brian Wilson heard Rubber Soul and responded with Pet Sounds. The Beatles heard that and responded with Pepper, etc. I gotta wonder the influence Marvin Gaye had on Stevie Wonder and Songs in the Key of Life because this is definitely more socially conscious material. And uh, maybe Marvin Gaye gave Stevie the courage to take that on. That's very, very likely, I would say. You know, I, I just love also Stevie vocally, how that man can just open up. I mean, a song on Songs in the Key of Life that always comes to mind is I Am Singing. I Am Singing. And the way he sings out okay. is just, you know, a breath of fresh air. It's amazing. Yeah, but, I mean, in this case, we chose Pastime Paradise, which, of course, later on got adapted into Gangster's Paradise. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, a very influential song in another genre. One parting thought, something to remember. Stevie was 26 years old when he did that album. I know, I know. And he was a veteran, right? He was a veteran. He, I mean, he'd been a, a international star for about 13 years at that point. Well, he had a hit in 1963. <laughs> yeah, think tips part one and two. Yeah, that's right. So by seventy six, he was a veteran at twenty six. Incredible. Well, another massive successful recording, same year, just to show you what seventy six was like. You had the Sex Pistols, you had Fleetwood Mac, you had Stevie Wonder. We also had the Eagles Hotel California, U.S. number one, U.K. number eight. Don Felder has been on the show. And I specifically did not ask him about writing that song because I know every interview he ever does, he gets asked about it. I spoke more about his childhood and things in his book. Um, you got to speak with Bill Simzik. Um, yes. And I'll tell you, before we get into the track, one thing that kind of surprised me that I've noticed, there's a lot of hate out there for the Eagles. Um, I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> Their music is solid. I don't know if it's a, a jealousy thing or they don't like the personalities of Glenn and Don, but I mean, there's a lot of hate for that band. I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I I think maybe the personalities may play a part in that. Also, you know, the fact that Hotel California is a pretty dark thing. It doesn't appeal to everyone. True. But, but it certainly had its impact at the time. I mean, it was, yeah, top the US chart and was top 10 in the UK. It was massive at that time. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how they rub people the wrong way, but they do. And as we mentioned before, the irony of them, Hotel California, I think the band was even located in Southern Cal, but the members yeah. were from Michigan, Texas, and et cetera. And another irony, which I did not realize until I read your book, that recording was recorded in Miami. They did two versions in California, but first they recorded it and found out that Don Felder had written it in a key that, that Don Henley couldn't really sing it in. Then they recorded it a second time, but they played it a little too fast. So the third time was the charm, but they were going between the, the record plant and, you know, bacteria slash criteria back and forth. And the version everybody knows was recorded in Miami. That's so funny. There's really yeah. no connection to California except lyrically. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Don would be happy to know that there's a big fat picture of him in your book. Not the whole band, just Don himself in front of a <laughs> crowd. I'm sure he'd be happy to know that. Uh, also, 76, David Bowie, Heroes. Yeah. My favorite Bowie track. I absolutely love that track. I always did. I, I love the increasingly manic quality as it goes along with his vocal. He ends up virtually hysterical on there. And, uh, yeah, just tremendous atmospherics. For me, it all comes together. I've never a major Bowie fan. I interviewed the guy. Uh, he was super nice. Um, but... Uh, as I said, I was never like his biggest fan, but this track, for me, it all comes together. Robert Fripp and Brian Eno contributing to that sort of era as well. And Tony Visconti, who you spoke about, you know, another, who you spoke with, rather, 
Um, our past guest, Lucy Woodward, worked with Tony and said he was really awesome and so great at his job and everything. But what I took away from this, you know, another one of these stories, Robert Fripp, he, his guitar part is mostly feedback on that recording. He, you know, most of us sort of do it by feel. You know, you hit a note and you sort of... He actually was scientific about it. He measured... You know, if, we want, if I want to get feedback on a G or an A flat, I mean, he, he did a little chart and made strips and put them on the floor so he knew exactly where to place his guitar to get it. And that's uh, pretty pretty astonishing. And you wouldn't know that unless somebody told you. Right. And Visconti, the producer engineer, right? So he's like got his hands on the faders while he's producing with Bowie. Um, so that's a, a different aspect as well. You know, some people believe that there's more strength in having a separate producer and engineer but here we're in the era of them being combined in some cases. So we mentioned Donna Summer and, and Disco. Well, in 77, you know, we've got the Bee Gees staying alive. So Disco was definitely arrived. And, you know, I lived in New York City when Saturday Night Fever came out. So I was right there, you know, at the dawn of that disco boom. Um, I started performing in bands in the summer of 77. You know, I was like 14. And uh, we actually, <laughs> uh, the um, rhythm guitarist in our band wanted to do more than a woman. And we were kind of like, uh. and so what we said was, we, our compromise was, we did the song, but instead of singing more than a woman, we sang, bald headed woman, bald headed woman to me. So at least, you know, he got to do the song, but we also got to make fun of it. But, you know, uh, you can't make fun of it too much. I mean, the Bee Gees were always off putting for me because of the way they sang, the sort of <laughs> kind of way they sang. The the songs themselves were great. They're, they're three cool guys, and I like the material, but... I like early Bee Gees, you know, yeah. the sort of beatle Bee Gees of the late 60s. I hear you. Uh, you know, when, when they went... I was never a big disco fan, I have to tell you. So, uh, again, this book isn't just about my favorite tracks. They're what we think are important tracks but uh yeah never my favorite once they go into their their falsetto era yeah exactly well um you know it's funny because carl richardson who you spoke with about this he says that the band would tell him things like just make it sound better and he'd say yeah well the console doesn't have a better knob you know you exactly. just turn it. <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> you know robert stigwood of course who was literally their brian epstein you know he had this huge success with saturday night fever followed by this huge flop with the Sgt. Pepper movie. You know, you see it from his perspective. It's like, well, you take the Beatles' biggest selling album, Sgt. Pepper, put it together with the current biggest band in the world right now, the Bee Gees, you know, populate it with stars. You've got the Beatles' music. What could go wrong? Well, also Peter Frampton, Frampton Comes Alive, was a huge hit. Right. Right. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong with having George Burns, you know, doing Beatles songs and Steve Martin and what, what could possibly be wrong with that? <laughs> One thing that's interesting for people to know, because this is such a familiar recording, there is a two-bar looped drum sample in Staying Alive, which was actually borrowed from Night Fever. Um, Barry Gibb didn't think the drums were quite happening, and uh, they took a, a, just a two-bar thing that was perfect, looped it and looped it, and that was the basis for Staying Alive, More Than a Woman, and Barbra Streisand's Woman in Love. Right. So they milked the hell out of those two bars, and then they credited the loop to Bernard Lupe. <laughs> I, I guess an homage to Bernard Purdy, drummer, yeah. but, you know, Lupe, because it was a loop. Absolutely, yeah. It's great, right? Those, like, little in-jokes that nod and wink to each other. Well, we have a sort of a, an interesting situation here with the next artist. We were talking about being popular in the U.S. and the U.K. Kate Bush, Wuthering Heights, 1978. Um Number one, UK, the US said, no, thank you, didn't chart. And um, one thing that's interesting about this was when I read that, before I finished reading your article, I thought, oh, this she's like the, uh, the mole of Kintyre. She's like one of these situations where she just connected with the English audience and not the US. Then I go on to read your article <laughs> and I find out that, um, you know, there was a delay on the release because she didn't like the artwork. And while it was being sorted out, Mull of Kintyre, it's number one so and for sense. weeks and weeks. And literally, if she would have released it on time, she probably wouldn't have had a number one in the UK because the song Mull of Kintyre would have kept it out. And I'd already written down Mull of Kintyre in my notes without knowing that aspect of it. So um, she did yeah. sort of catch on um, later. And, uh, you know, I just remember at the time when it came out, it was something of a novelty because we're talking about the falsetto voice of the Bee Gees, you know, Barry Gibb. Mm -hmm. And uh, here you've got, Kate Bush in full head voice. 
Um, and uh, yeah, at the time it was like, what the hell, you, you know, but it was different. And it did top the chart because it had a fantastic melody. Yeah. I personally loved the follow up, The Man with the Child in His Eyes. That yeah. really grabbed me. Yeah, now but, that I think of it, I, Tiny Tim might be a comparison, you know. Uh, right. That kind yeah. of thing. It just struck people sort of the wrong way. But she was clearly talented and very young. Yeah, I mean, she was like, you know, EMI signed her. I don't know if she was like about 16 or something and kind of gave her a piano and said, like, just go away and work for a year. Just, you know, refine your craft. And that's what happened. Um, and Kathy Bush turned into Kate Bush. And, and uh, yeah, she had the talent to back it up, to back up the hype. And boy, artist development is another thing that you don't have anymore. I mean, that's just gone now. Exactly. They were willing to like basically say, okay, we've signed her. Now, you know, we don't have to rush the product out. Let, let's, you know, give her time to develop, which well, is fantastic. It paid off. Well, we've had Lee Sklar on the show who's played with everybody. And, and he said that, you know, back in the day, you grab someone like Bonnie Raitt and the label would just stick with her. And she put out an album, maybe it didn't sell great, it didn't, it didn't. And then she'd have her big hit, which she did, and it would pay for all the back catalog. And, you know, it's smart. Now it's like, boy, you got to you got to hit, right? If there even is a music industry anymore, it's like, you got to be good to go. We got to make a million bucks off you right out the gate or forget it. So yeah, yeah that's unfortunate. Um, well, yet again, another eclectic twist, Chic, Le Freak, 1978, number one US, number seven UK. There's a story about the origination of that song that I knew about half the story. So I appreciate your book fleshing it out for me. I spoke with Noel Rogers, who obviously yeah. was the partner of Bernard Edwards. And, uh, yeah, the, the story was that they already were having some hits, but they weren't names yet. So New Year's Eve 1977, they're in their fancy suits and they're trying to get into Studio 54. Grace Jones was supposed to get them in and she forgot to leave their name at the door and they refused entry and they're really pissed about it. It's New Year's Eve. They got nowhere to go. So they end up going back to one of their apartments and, you know, getting drunk and doing this song that is expressing how they're feeling in the moment, which was, ah, fuck off. And uh, eventually <laughs> it was like decided, well, that won't quite cut it on the chart. So they toned it down. They did. And it just goes to show you how, you know, turning a negative into a positive. And if I was them, I'd thank Grace Jones later. I'd go, hey, thanks for not putting us on the list. Because yeah. uh, we went back and wrote a number one smash. And of course, right. you know, Nile Rodgers, you know, an artist and then a producer and then a incredible producer and really still has his hand in today because he was on that daft punk track get lucky yeah uh, well as i said some of these tunes i was familiar with and some of these tunes i'd listen to you know sort of detached but some of them i would actually listen to for enjoyment and that would be the case with the next one the who who are you 1978 yeah. you know and this thing about incorporating the band name into the song you know anybody else singing who are you you wouldn't think about it but they are the who so just as we spoke about, you know, uh, Miles Davis having a bit of a reputation, Keith Moon, same kind of thing, uh, could be a bit of an asshole. And, you know, your engineer told the story about how he had dialed in the drum sound very carefully, worked real hard on it, and Keith played the drums, goes, does it sound right? Yeah. Then he just knocks all the drums down, you know, ruins all the guy's work. Well, if there's nobody there to get the joke, but the guy you're screwing over isn't really funny, so... You know. uh, it's, it's total asshole behavior and uh you know the guy was like off his rocker half the time at this point you know he's in bad shape um his timing isn't what it was and it was never that sharp but uh, obviously he's a, a, an incredible drummer um but yeah he, he's turned into something of a liability for them both on the road and in the studio well, he was a wild man, and that's why they wanted him, but the baggage comes with that. What I didn't know is, we spoke about the Sex Pistols. I didn't know there was a connection to the Sex Pistols in terms of the lyrics of the song. Pete Townsend had ran into Steve Jones and Paul Cook in a club. You know, they were admirers of his, you know, because he's sort of an early punk attitude, of course. Um, and he was an admirer of theirs, and in fact, maybe a little bit envious, because we talked about, you know, Sex Pistols losing some authenticity in the eyes of their fans when they became commercial, but they were still way behind someone like The Who in terms of being commercial. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so they sort of uh, were a big factor in the lyrics of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe the title should have been Who the Fuck Are You? That's more likely what he said to them. He was drunk that night when he ran into them. And, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't the best of meetings, that's for sure. Well, Roger does sing that in one version of the song, and then when they decide it was a single, he actually went in and re-recorded Who the Hell Are You? But, of course, people have heard both versions. And, you know, 
one thing I think about with the Who, you know, Keith Moon always gets his props as a, a great drummer in his way. Uh, John Entwistle as a great bass player, two of the best ever. And Townsend gets recognition for his songwriting, but in my opinion, he doesn't get enough credit for his unique approach to keyboard playing. Yeah. Um, you know, Won't Get Fooled Again, Baba O'Reilly, and Who Are You, Eminence Front, which came later. He has a unique approach. Some of it is sort of sequencing, and some of it is he's playing, but nobody plays the keyboards quite like Pete Townsend. Right, I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. Another thing about this song and this chapter in the book is it's one of several where the finished product conceals the tensions going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's definite tension in the studio here, not only with Keith being out of control, but also between Roger Daltrey and Glenn John who's producing and engineering alongside John Astley. I, I interviewed John. I've interviewed Glenn as well, as it happens. But uh, in this particular case, um, matters sort of boil to a head when at some point Roger Daltrey leans over the console and says, I want to hear more bass. And Glenn Johns takes exception to it, and it results in a kerfuffle out in the hallway uh, with Daltrey headbutting Glenn Johns and breaking his nose and driving off. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Wow, all this to make a record. Well, apparently another uh, tense situation was the band Blondie. And another case where if you ask somebody, name a Blondie song, you're going to hear Heart of Glass, Tide is High, maybe even Rapture. Uh, Hanging on the Telephone is the one you did. And this was like a charted number five UK and sort of US nothing. So Yeah, well, again, it's another one where, you know, you talked about Hendrix earlier, and it's one of numerous examples. But where, you know, an American act is bigger in the UK. And, and there are numerous examples also of UK acts that are always bigger in the US. I, I think it's a case of, you know, the other man's grass is always greener. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, with Blondie, they really rose to prominence in the UK in that, you know, quote unquote, new wave era with the Plastic Letters album, their second album in, I think, was that 77? And uh, they, they were huge. You know, Heart of Glass kind of came towards the end of all that, you know, where they suddenly move into disco. That's when they caught on in the US. It was kind of ironic. Mm. But their grit, their grittier material, their, their, for me, far better material came before Heart of Glass. And the Parallel Line album was just tremendous. It was one of those albums which just stacked with hits. And you sort of realize that this is a happening band. You know, they're, they're serious stuff. And so I interviewed the producer engineer, Mike Chapman, and, uh, yeah, he told the story of all the internal tensions, as you say, that were running through that band. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a trade-off. The Who at least had the self-awareness to know that, look, you know, and as, as actually happened when Keith Moon died, you can't swap out members, likewise the Beatles. You can't mm. swap anybody out. You don't have your thing anymore. And, uh, you know, Blondie isn't on that level, but they're one of those ones where they had tensions, but, you know, they created... And I also got the impression they were a band... As opposed to a band like, let's say, Yes, where everyone in the band is a virtuoso. I think members of Blondie had different degrees of competency. You know, like, yeah. like one person might be a really good guitar player and one person is a little more average and you know, that has problems. And also if you have like an engineer or a producer who's a technically a better musician than the people playing, you know, that becomes another matter too. Uh, yeah, and in the case of Blondie, as you say, I mean, I know that there was some tension with Clem Burke, the drummer who I've always loved, who is an Anglophile and very much a sort of, you know, a disciple of Keith Moon and his style. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he often felt that he should be getting more recognition, that he should be central. And there were, that was a sort of central theme with Blondie. You know, Debbie Harry's at the center of it, but the guys around are often thinking, well, hold on, I should be getting more credit here. And then you throw into the mix Mike Chapman, who, as you say, is very talented, but he's got his own ego. If you look at the photos in the book, he's clowning around yeah. more than the band in the photos. <laughs> so you've got his ego thrown in there as well. But it, it did, you know, produce great results. 